number four. The Claude Hamilton 440s. The Claude Hamiltons were a series of 440 express passenger engines built for the Great Eastern Railway, with a total of 121 built at Stratford Works from 1900 to 1923. They were designed by James Holden, who was locomotive superintendent for the GER from 1885 to 1907, before being succeeded by his son, Stephen Holden. They were also nicknamed after the first member of the class, number 1900, which was officially named after Lord Claude Hamilton, chairman for the Great Eastern Railway between 1893 and 1922. The Claude Hamiltons were separated into three classes, the S46s, the D56s, and the H88s, which were then later reclassified as the D14s, D15s, and D16s when the Great Eastern became absorbed into the London and Northeastern Railway in 1923. The first class of Claude Hamiltons, the S46s, L and the R D14s, have 41 members built between 1900 and 1903, while the second class, the D56s, L and the R D15s, had 70 built between 1903 and 1911. Both the S46s and D56s were pretty similar to each other, with both classes being built with 7 foot diameter driving wheels and 4 foot 9 inch diameter boilers. The only major difference between the two was that the S46s were built with a round top firebox, while the D56s were built with a more squarish shaped bell pair firebox. The third and final class, the H88s, L and the R D16s, with only 10 builds in 1923, were also known as the Super Claudes, as they were built with superheaters and larger 5 foot 1 and 1 8 inch diameter boilers. When the Claude Hamiltons were introduced back in 1900, they were the largest express engines on the Great Eastern Railway at that time, and were soon put to work on the railway's principal express services. Some of their most notable work was on the Norfolk Coast Express, which operated between Liverpool Street Station and Cromer. However, the Claude Hamiltons soon became outclassed following the introduction of the Great Eastern Class S69 460 10-wheelers, later the LNDR B12s, designed by Stephen Holden in 1911, which replaced their 440 predecessors on the heaviest express trains. After which, the Claude Hamiltons were then reallocated the passenger services on the Cambridge mainline, as well as other various cross-country routes. Following the formation of the LNER after the Grouping Act in 1923, the Claude Hamiltons found themselves working throughout various parts of the LNER network, heading both passenger and goods trains, even into the days of BR after nationalization in 1948. Sadly though, even before British Railways, withdrawal for the class began in 1945. By 1960, the Claude Hamiltons ceased to exist. But not for much longer. A group known as the Claude Hamilton Locomotive Group are currently working on constructing a replica of D16 Super Claude number 8783, one of two of the Claude Hamiltons that pulled the Royal Train. Originally nameless, the replica of number 8783 is to be officially named Phoenix, with nameplates for the replica engine already being made. Currently, work on building the replica Claude Hamilton itself has been pretty slow. So far, the only components they've managed to complete were the front buffer beam and frame plates for the front leading bogey, and they even managed to purchase an old whistle from one of the original Claude Hamiltons. Number 3 The Great Western Railway, Dean Singles and Armstrongs now we're getting up to my top three most favorite long lost steam locomotives from both the US and UK. And starting it off at the number three spot are the 3031 class 422s, also known as the Achilles class, or more favorably, the Dean Singles, and the seven class 440s, otherwise known as the Armstrongs, both of which were built for the Great Western Railway back during the late Victorian era. Both the Dean Singles and Armstrongs were designed by William Dean, chief locomotive engineer for the Great Western between 1877 and 1902, and both were built at Swindon between 1894 and 1899, with 80 Dean Singles being built between said years, and only four prototype Armstrongs built in 1894. William Dean was best known for designing some of the most elegantly styled steam engines for the GWR. 
Some of his other classes included the 3300 Bulldog Class 440s, the 3206 Barnum Class 240s, and the 2301 Dean Goods Class 060s. The first 30 members of the Dean Singles actually started their lives as the Great Western 3001 Class 222s, which were originally broad gauge back when they were first built, but then later converted to standard gauge in 1892. However, these engines were found to be too heavy in the front end, and after a derailment caused by one of these engines at Box Tunnel in 1893 due to a broken axle, it was decided to have them rebuilt with a four-wheel front leading bogey, thus leading to the birth of the Dean Singles in 1894. After their conversion into the Dean Single 422s, they ran much more smoothly and were able to keep up the good speeds while pulling passenger trains, thus leading to the further 50 being built until 1899. During their time in service, they were found to be pulling express trains in the west of England, between London and Newton Abbott via Bristol. One more notable member of the class was number 3041, named the Queen originally named James Mason, which was one example of the class that was assigned to pull the Royal Train. As for the Armstrongs, as mentioned earlier, only four prototype locomotives were built in 1894, around the same time the Dean Singles were introduced, and it started off as four of Dean's experimental locomotives, numbered 7, 8, 14, and 16. In fact, if it hadn't been for the accident at Box Tunnel in 1893 mentioned earlier, they most likely would have been built as 222s. But because of that accident, they emerged from the works as double-framed 440s. The major difference being the Armstrongs having a second pair of driving wheels in place of where the pair of trailing wheels would be on the Dean Singles, and the Armstrongs having slightly smaller driving wheels than the Dean Singles, by about 8 inches. So basically, these engines were two different variants of each other, much like Churchwood's County 440s and 442 tank engines earlier on this list. Except unlike Churchwood's counties and county tanks, the Dean Singles and Armstrongs proved to be much more successful and much smoother runners. When these engines were rebuilt into the Armstrongs, they were also given new names. Number 7 was named Armstrong after the second superintendent for the Great Western, Joseph Armstrong, Number 8 was named Gooch, after the first superintendent, Sir Daniel Gooch. Number 14 was named Charles Saunders, who was secretary and superintendent for the GWR. And finally, number 16 was named Brunel, after Isambard Kingdom Brunel, one of Great Britain's greatest civil engineers in history, and the founder of the Great Western Railway himself, way back in 1835. The Armstrongs normally saw service running passenger trains between London and Bristol after they were built, but later started work north of Wolverhampton sometime in 1910, after Churchward succeeded Dean as chief mechanical engineer for the Great Western, and his 3700 City Class 440s and 4000 Star Class 460 10-wheelers were introduced. However, both the Dean Singles and Armstrong's time in service wouldn't last for much longer. Despite the Dean Singles speed and performance, their 422 wheel arrangement eventually became outdated as larger locomotives with more driving wheels were developed as the 20th century went on. Withdrawal for the Dean Singles began in February 1908, with the final surviving member of the class, number 3074, Princess Helena, being withdrawn in December of 1916. As for the Armstrongs, they were slowly rebuilt between 1915 and 1923 and became Churchward's 4100 Flower Class 440s, renumbered 1469 and 1472. After which, they mainly saw service as station pilots and, at times, saw service on local trains on the northern sections. The final survivor of the class, number 4169 Brunel, was finally withdrawn sometime in 1930 after which both the Dean Singles and the Armstrongs were no more. But their story isn't quite over yet, or at least not that of the Dean Singles. In December 1982, a full-scale replica of number 3041, the Queen, was constructed and set on display at the Windsor and Eaton Central Railway Station as part of the Railways and Royalty Exhibition. However, this replica was solely built for static display, so it isn't an actual working engine. Its front leading wheels and rear trailing wheels came from a former Great Western engine's tender, 
and the engine's tender itself was originally from a London, Brighton, and South Coast Railway C2X Class 060, only cosmetically restored and modified to look like a GWR Dean era tender. In fact, the top half of the replica Dean Singles driving wheels, which would normally be hidden beneath the wheel splashes, don't even exist, and because of that, they don't even sit on the rails. Instead, the engine could only roll on its leading and trailing wheels, so it could be shunted wherever it would be displayed. The replica was even fitted with smoke and steam generators, which would expel smoke from the funnel and steam from the whistle, safety valve, and inside the cab, and was even fitted with a sound unit as well. So this replica was somewhat like a full-scale model train, except that it couldn't really run out of its own power. The replica Dean Single can still be seen there today. However, the tender has long since been removed and scrapped in order to make space for the shopping center inside the station building. Well, not all of the tender was scrapped. The axle boxes, springs, and complete wheel set were purchased by the Bluebell Railway and used for their project for a new build of an LBSCR H2 Class 442 Atlantic. Number 2 Hold it, hold it, hold it! I'm not done with the Dean Singles and Armstrongs yet! As I was about to say before that little... Uh, interruption, there may be a possibility that the Dean Singles could be running on rails again. Back in 2013, the Didcot Railway Center had released a post on their Facebook page discussing the possibility of building a brand new Dean Single from the ground up. However, there hasn't been much more information about this project since then, so here's hoping they still have this possible project on their minds. I'm sure there are other 442 single-wheel steam engines in the UK that many other people would rather prefer, such as the Great Northern Railway Stirling Singles, the Midland Railway Johnson Spinners, and even the broad-gauge Great Western Iron Dukes. But for me, there's just something about the Dean Singles and Armstrongs that really catch my eye and I think they are very fitting examples of Great Western steam locomotives between the late 19th century and early 20th century. Okay, now we can get on with the number 2 spot. Number 2 The New York Central Hudson's If there is one class of large, fast, express passenger steam locomotives in the United States that I and I'm pretty sure many others, feel at least one should have made it into preservation, it is definitely these, the New York Central's iconic J-Class 464 Hudson's. A total of 275 Hudson's were built between 1927 and 1938, with the majority of them being built by Alco. The Hudson's came to be when the New York Central's current fleet of 462 Pacifics were no longer able to keep up with the demands for longer and heavier trains at higher speeds. Since they couldn't make any of their Pacifics longer, they would need to design a new class of express passenger locomotives that could hold a larger boiler. Their answer came in the form of the 284 Berkshire-type steam locomotive, as their four-wheel trailing truck was able to accommodate a larger firebox. A larger firebox meant a bigger fire could be made, boil more water inside the boiler, and create more steam. And more steam meant more power. And speed. And so, in 1927, the first 464 steam locomotive for the New York Central was introduced, and from then on, they just kept rolling out of the Alco shops until 1938. The New York Central had officially named their new passenger locomotives the Hudson's, after the Hudson River, which the railroad ran alongside. And that soon became the official name for the 464 wheel arrangement in North America, as the New York Central was the first to operate these locomotives. The Hudson's soon proved their worth keeping the time on the New York Central's top express passenger trains, including the 20th Century Limited, the railroad's premier passenger train, alongside the NYC's water level route between New York City and Chicago, Illinois, and the Empire State Express between New York and Buffalo. During the mid to late 1930s, in order to keep up passenger ridership during the Great Depression, as well as remain ahead in the competition with the ever-going popularity in road and air travel, the Hudson's became subject to streamlining, the man responsible being Art Deco designer Henry Dreyfus. In 1934, Hudson number 5344 received a new upside-down bathtub-styled streamlined shroud and was given the name Commodore Vanderbilt after the infamous railroad robber baron back in the 1860s and 70s. 
Not only was the Commodore Vanderbilt the first Hudson on the New York Central to receive a streamlined casing, but also the very first steam locomotive in general to be officially streamlined and was put to work on the railroad's famous 20th Century Limited. In 1938, 10 of the Hudsons were built with a completely brand new bullet-like streamlined body, which became the most famous and iconic look for the New York Central Hudsons and were used primarily on the new streamlined 20th Century Limited. Then in 1941, two more Hudsons, number 5426 and 5429, received a new streamlined body similar to those used on the 20th Century Limited, except they excluded the fin across the front headlight and were colored black and silver. These two engines were used exclusively for the new stainless steel streamlined Empire State Express to commemorate the train's 50th anniversary. During their time in service, the Hudsons have even taken part in a few significant events as well. In 1927, one of the newly built Hudsons, number 5205, attended the Baltimore and Ohio's Fair of the Iron Horse. And in 1939, two of the streamlined Dreyfus Hudsons, number 5449 and 5453, took part in the New York World's Fair, with number 5449 even doing a nose-to-nose -nose golden spike pose with the rival Pennsylvania Railroad streamlined K4 Pacific number 3768 from earlier. However, as good as their streamlining was, it didn't last for too long. They had all been removed from all of the Hudsons between 1945 and 1950. Also, the Hudsons' time in service didn't last for too much longer either. During the early to late 1950s, the New York Central was completely adamant in the supremacy of diesel power, and so all the Hudsons were retired from service between 1953 and 1956. By 1960, all of the Hudsons were scrapped far too quickly for anyone to have a chance to save even one for preservation. Well, almost not even one. The largest part of the Hudsons that has managed to make it into preservation is the tender of number 5313, which was converted into a steam generator car for use on passenger trains on the Toronto, Hamilton, and Buffalo Railroad after the engine itself was scrapped in 1954. It can still be seen today on stag display at Steamtown National Historic Site in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Also, even though none of the Hudsons themselves managed to make it into preservation, they still retain quite a legacy to this day. One place that especially holds a special place for the Hudsons is Lionel Trains, where they have become one of their signature locomotives since they were first issued and released by Lionel back in 1937. Not only were they the first locomotives that Lionel had produced a precisely detailed scale model after, they were also the favorite steam locomotives of Joshua Lionel Cowan, the founder and former CEO of Lionel Trains himself. Since 1937, Lionel has produced many other models of this iconic New York Central steam engine, in both its regular and streamlined appearance. There have been one or more attempts to build a brand new Hudson from the ground up, but in one way or another, these projects have stalled or come to a complete stop altogether. And right now, it doesn't seem like a new Hudson is going to be built anytime soon, due to the new project for the new Pennsylvania T1 duplex. But hopefully someday, in the not-too-distant future, a new build project for a New York Central Hudson will be built, and one of these engines could be riding the rails of the Northeastern United States once again. Before we get to the number one spot on the list, let's have a look at some honorable mentions.
battle for the number one spot on my top 20 long lost American and British steam locomotives. The Central Pacific Railroad number 173. Now, you're probably wondering how this little old 440 American came to be at the number one spot on my list. Well, just listen up and you'll find out why. Number 173 was originally built back in 1864 by Norris Locomotive Works in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for the Western Pacific Railroad. Not that Western Pacific. This was a different one that operated in California from the early to late 1860s. When the locomotive was built, it was originally lettered H and named Sonoma. This railroad also had an interesting method of identifying its locomotives using letters of the alphabet rather than conventional cab numbers like on all other American railroads. When the Central Pacific Railroad acquired the Western Pacific in 1868, the letter H became the number 173. However, about a year into its new working life on the Central Pacific, on November 14, 1869, the 173 was involved in a head-on collision with Central Pacific 460 10-wheeler number 177, named Atherton, at Alameda Junction. This was the first major passenger train accident in the history of the Central Pacific. Fifteen people lost their lives, including the engineers and firemen of both trains, and both the 173 and 177 received extensive damage. After the wreck, both locomotives were taken to the Central Pacific's main shops in Sacramento, where they were kept in storage. A couple of years later, the Central Pacific's master mechanic, Andrew Jackson Stevens, was tasked with rebuilding the 173. Despite the amount of damage the locomotive had sustained from its crash in Alameda, Stevens found that many of its parts can be reusable, including the engine's frames and boiler, so he decided to use the 173 as a testbed for the Central Pacific's entry into manufacturing its own locomotives. The newly rebuilt number 173 emerged from the Sacramento shops in November 1872, and its new design proved to be very successful. So successful, in fact, that it resulted in 12 more identical-looking engines being built, including three that were then sold to other railroads. One of those three being the Virginia and Truckee Railroad's number 18, the Dayton, preserved today at the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City, Nevada, and the sole survivor of number 173's rebuilt design. The 173 continued the work for the Central Pacific, mainly working up in Northern California, until the railroad would be absorbed into the Southern Pacific in 1885. The engine would be renumbered into the Southern Pacific number 1285 sometime between 1891 and 1901, then renumbered again to 1523 and 1907. The engine would continue to run in service until its inevitable retirement in 1909 then after which was simply scrapped. Now here is where the 173's real significance comes in, as, believe it or not, this locomotive is associated with none other than Walter E. Disney, the famous animator and founder of Walt Disney Studios, and even played a part in the creation of Disneyland. Apart from his legendary work as an animator and filmmaker, as well as the mind behind the creation of Mickey Mouse and his friends, Walt Disney also had a great love for trains, which he had ever since childhood back when he lived in Marceline, Missouri, when his uncle worked as a locomotive engineer for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. Or just the Santa Fe for short. It was also Disney's love for trains and railroading that played a key role in the creation of Disneyland in 1955. The 173 comes into Walt Disney's story when he was constructing his 7 and a quarter inch gauge miniature Carrollwood Pacific Railroad in the backyard of his residence home at Holmby Hills in Los Angeles, California. When Disney was looking for a suitable 1800s era design for his locomotive, Roger Brogy, a precision machinist who worked for Disney Studios, who was considered to be the first Disney Imagineer, recommended a friend of his named Gerald M. Best, who was a pioneering sound engineer for Warner Brothers, as well as a railroad historian and photographer. While Best was showing Disney around his home, Walt happened to spot a 12-inch scale model of the Central Pacific 173, which Best had made back in 1939, and decided that this was the perfect locomotive design for his Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. 
When Disney presented Roger Brogy the photographs of the 173 Best had provided for him and told him that he wanted to build his miniature locomotive after it, they then managed to acquire the complete set of blueprints of the 173 from the Sacramento shops, which were then operated by the Southern Pacific after they took over the Central Pacific. After acquiring the blueprints, Brogy then got to work copying the drawings down to 1-8 scale for Disney's Carrollwood Pacific. Once they were complete, construction for the miniature locomotive took place in the machine shops at Walt Disney Studios. After almost a year of hard work, on Christmas Eve 1949, Disney had the 1-8 scale number 173, which he had affectionately named the Lily Bell after his wife, Lillian Disney, steamed up for the first time and ran it around a loop of track inside the studio's sound stage one. After the finishing touches were added onto the locomotive, the Lily Bell was then delivered to its new home on the Carrollwood Pacific in May 1950, where Walt enjoyed driving his miniature train around his backyard railroad, giving rides to family and visitors. However, the Lily Bell's time on the Carrollwood Pacific lasted for only about three years. In spring of 1953, a guest engineer had driven the Lily Bell too fast around a curve and caused it to turn over on its side. The impact from the derailment caused the whistle to break off, releasing a jet of high-pressure steam across the ground. The crash had attracted the attention of a curious five-year-old girl, who ran up to see what had happened and inadvertently stepped into the invisible jet of steam, causing her to receive quite a scare as well as minor but painful burns to her legs. After the incident, Walt Disney became concerned about the possibility for another potential accident. Thus, he told Roger Brogy to take the Lily Bell back to the studio's machine shop to be stored. After which, Disney decided to close down his backyard Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. Jump to a couple of years later in 1955, when Disneyland was first opened to the public. One attraction that has always remained operational at this timeless theme park since its opening and still continues to run to this day is the Disneyland Railroad, a three-foot narrow gauge railroad that runs around the park and stops at four different stations. During the construction of Disneyland, the first locomotives and rolling stock for the park's railroad were built at Walt Disney Studios. One of the Disneyland's first locomotives was the number one, the C.K. Holiday, named after Cyrus Kurtz Holiday, the founder and first president of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad himself. The C.K. Holiday's design is based on that of the Carrollwood Pacific's Lily Bell, which, in a way, makes it based on the Central Pacific number 173, as it was built to resemble a classic 1800s-era wood-burning steam locomotive with its large diamond-shaped smokestack, kerosene burning box headlight, and shining brass parts. The C.K. Holiday, along with locomotive number two, the E.P. Ripley, has been running around the Disneyland Railroad taking visitors from station to station since the park's opening and has become the railroad's most iconic locomotive. Also, on July 29, 2017, the C.K. Holiday got to pull the inaugural train for the reopening of the Disneyland Railroad after it was rerouted in order to accommodate the construction of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, the new Star Wars-themed area of the park. As for the Lily Bell locomotive itself, today it stands on stag display with some of its Carrollwood Pacific Railroad cars at the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco, California, founded back on October 1, 2009 in dedication to the legacy of Walt Disney. Also, a replica of the Lily Bell, officially named the Lily Bell 2, can be seen today on display inside Disneyland's Main Street Station. The Central Pacific No. 173 is one historic American steam locomotive I would definitely like to see someone build a full-scale operational replica of someday in future, as this is one locomotive that has quite a bit of unique history behind it. From not only serving as the first step to Central Pacific's, then later the Southern Pacific, own build locomotives, to its role in the legacy of Walt Disney. And if anyone ever does decide to build a full-scale replica of the 173, it probably wouldn't be too hard to secure the plans to build it. After all, if the blueprints for the original engine managed to survive into the late 40s and early 50s when Roger Brogy used them to make his plans for the Lily Bell, it might be possible that they could still be around somewhere today. Or at least a refined copy of them. But if not, then they could possibly use the blueprints for the Lily Bell and rescale them back to full scale for the replica, like how Roger Brogy has scaled down the original ones to 1/8 scale for the Lily Bell. 
Another good source for preferences for the replica would be the Virginia and Truckee's Dayton mentioned earlier, since it is the sole survivor of the original 173's design. Its place in history as the Central Pacific Railroad's first step in building its own locomotives, as well as its role in the legacy of Walt Disney, his love for trains, and even the creation of Disneyland, are the main reasons why I would love to see a full-scale operational replica of this old-time steam locomotive built someday in future, as well as the main reasons why the Central Pacific Railroad 440 number 173 holds a number one spot in my top 20 long-lost American and British British steam locomotives. Thanks for watching. If you liked my top 20 list, or if there are any other long lost steam locomotives that aren't on this list that come to your mind, please leave a like and a comment down below. Until next time, have a good day, or night, or whenever you're watching this, and happy railroading!